To this week's presentation, The Irish Soldiers of Mexico, presented by Dr. Michael Hogan, PhD. This is the story of a group of men, mostly Irish, who fought on the Mexican side during the U.S. invasion of 1846-48. Members of an artillery unit called Los San Patricio, or Soldiers of St. Patrick. They saw action in almost every battle of the Mexican War. They were captured by U.S. forces after the Battle of Churubusco in August 1847. Forty were executed in the largest hanging affair in the history of North America. Hogan will discuss why they joined the Mexicans, why the punishments were so harsh, and why they have become a Mexican legend. Michael Hogan, Ph.D., is a historian, educator, and author of 24 books, including Abraham Lincoln in Mexico, and the Irish Soldiers of Mexico, which was the basis for an MGM movie starring Tom Berenger. He is Emeritus Humanities Chair at the American School F Foundation of Guadalajara and a former professor of international relations at the Autonomous University of Guadalajara. He is a member of the Organization of American Historians, the American Historical Association, and the Geographical Society of Mexico. And he is with us today. Please join me in welcoming. Negroes and Indians were inferior in terms of evolution 
And this was in the science text in Boston in 1846. Also, by the time the Pilgrims uh, arrived, the Puritans arrived in New Salem, named after Jerusalem, uh, in the early 1600s, it wasn't because they sought solely religious freedom for everybody, but because they wanted to get away from their persecution uh, in the old world. <coughs> they wanted freedom for themselves. They were also anti-monarchists, and they were also anti-Catholic and anti-Church of England. <laughs> they conceived that this new city, this new Salem, would be a city on the hill. A city that would attract like-minded people to its shores. And that ultimately, they would inherit the entire continent from sea to shining sea. And this concept was called Manifest Destiny. Manifest means you don't have to prove it. It's just, you know, that's just the way God you know, set things up for us. Yeah. And history tended to prove them correct. By 1810, we had the Louisiana Purchase, which an enormous swath of land uh, was sold to us by, uh, by the French. Um, and in 1830, a group of immigrants began to settle in Mexico at the invitation of the Mexican government. And these people that settled in the state of Coahuila in Texas with the agreement that they would not bring guns, they would not bring slaves, and that they would conform to the Catholic faith. And of course, right from the start, we know <laughs> they didn't agree with any three of those. And so they were essentially, having violated the terms of their immigration, were illegal immigrants the first illegal immigrants in the Americas, by the way. <laughs> Eventually, they rose up against the Mexican government and staged a revolt at the Alamo, we all know the story of that, and uh, were successful and established an independent republic called the Lone Star Republic. By 1845, they began to get nervous because they thought, well, you know, Mexico might want this area back at some point, and we really don't have enough forces to protect ourselves. So let's become, let's petition to become a state in the Union, and that way we'll have the backing of the United States Army. So in 1845, they petitioned and were admitted uh, as a state of the Union. That same year, a new president uh, took office by the name of James K. Polk. And Polk had the idea that Manifest Destiny was taking too long, you know? That maybe it could be accelerated. And one way to do that would be to make the Mexicans an offer they couldn't refuse. $25 million for California. That would be a bargain. And then a land route across what is now known as New Mexico, Arizona territory, so that indeed the country would be from sea to shining sea. <clears throat> and they offered the Mexicans another $15 million for that. Well, the Mexican <coughs> government said no. Polk said no. No one says no to Americans. Yeah. <laughs> Let me send the army into Texas to kind of put a little pressure. And so he sent the army under a fellow by the name of Zachary Taylor to San Antonio, Texas, actually to Corpus Christi, and then ultimately to San Antonio, Texas, uh, where the army kind of camped out and were putting quiet pressure on the Mexicans. Mexicans still refused to sell. So folks said, well, Taylor, move the army down to the Rio Grande and see what that does. Well, at that time, the border between Texas and Mexico was the Rio Moises River, which is up by San Antonio the Rio Grande and all the area in between the Rio Grande and the Rio Moises was Mexican territory. The minute that army moved south, it was now in Mexican territory. And by the time they got to the Rio Grande, indeed they were attacked by a Mexican cavalry unit. Uh, half a dozen uh, Americans were killed and immediately Polk declared war. He said, since Americans have been killed on American soil, a state of war now exists in the United States, between Mexico and the U.S. Some of you remember uh, when I was here a month ago for Lincoln, I mean, a year ago for Lincoln's birthday, 
We talked about what Abraham Lincoln did when he was congressman from Illinois. He stood up in Congress and said, wait a minute, show me on the map where this is American territory. It's obviously Mexican territory, and the Mexicans shed the first blood. And he said again and again, show me the spot, show me the spot, show me the spot. And they began calling him Spotty Lincoln. Uh, he, he was not re-elected to the Congress. He ran for the Senate. He went to see it twice for the Senate. Uh, he asked for a position as Postmaster General. They turned him down for that. It looked like his career was dead in the water. So meanwhile, back to these Irish guys who uh, came over with a million refugees. Uh, they had joined the American army because there was no employment. You know? But they had no idea at the time they joined that they would be joining an Anglo-Protestant army that was invading a southern Catholic neighbor. And once they discovered that, it seemed like deja vu all over again. <laughs> because from the, from the 16th century on, they were victims of an Anglo-Protestant invasion of their country. So many of them, as soon as they got to the Rio Grande, deserted. Uh, the reason they gave for leaving was that there were no Catholic or chaplains in the army, and they wanted to attend Mass in Matamoro. They just never came back from Matamoro. There were about 40 of them, including John Riley, who later became the head of the, of the battalion. Now, 40 does not constitute a battalion, so we'll get to how they increase their numbers. But at this time, remember that war had not been officially declared when they moved to the, to the Rio Grande the first time. Um, so all of these men were not guilty of desertion under fire. They had deserted prior to uh, any altercations occurring. When they joined the Mexicans, they decided they wanted to stick together. So they were experienced in artillery, and they asked if they could form their own artillery unit. And the generals in, in the Mexican army agreed, and they agreed on the name, which would be the Soldiers of St. Patrick, or in Spanish, El Batallón de San Patricio. And they had a special flag made, uh, a battle flag, which was green and gold in color. And it had on one side the portrait of uh, St. Patrick with his staff, and on the other side the Mexican coat of arms, and underneath both of them, Erin Gobra, Ireland forever. <laughs> so they fought in a number of battles, and I'm only going to talk about three of them because they were kind of interesting. The first one was Monterrey. When they invaded the first big city the Americans encountered was Monterrey. And as they surrounded the city, they decided they were going to attack it first with artillery. And the Mexicans knew they were going to do this. So the Mexicans made sure that the civilians in Monterey were protected and they put them in a safe place. Then the artillery commander said, OK, see that cathedral there? Let's use that cathedral as our focal point to determine what the range is going to be. Well, the cathedral was the place where the Mexicans had put the civilians for their protection. When the Irish discovered that, and they saw the civilians fleeing, many of them on fire and wounded, they deserted as well. So now, the battalion had grown from 40 to over 200. After the Battle of Monterey, where the Mexicans surrendered, to preserve human life. The next move of, of the American Army and Navy was an amphibious invasion from the other side of Mexico in Veracruz. It was the largest amphibious invasion in the history of the world and stood that way until D-Day in 1944, 45. Um, they moved from Veracruz after bombing that city for several days, six days, um, and killing thousands of civilians, onto Mexico City. When they arrived at Mexico City, or the outskirts of Mexico City, the major impasse was the ex-convento of Churubusco. And that was manned by the Irish artillery. They were winning the battle. 
and then a chispa, a spark, set off the uh, ammunition part and blew up the ammunition. So the Mexicans put up the white flag of surrender. The Irish, who still had their American rifles and their American munitions, refused to surrender, and about half of them died in that battle before an American officer put up the white flag himself to stop the slaughter. Uh, those San Patricios who survived were put on trial for desertion. Um, after the trial and their convictions, uh, those who had deserted prior to the war were whipped at the stake, not by an American soldier, but by a muleteer. And the muleteer lost count several times. They were supposed to get 40 lashes, but John Riley, who was the leader of the battalion, uh, was whipped so many times that, according to witnesses, his back looked like uh, carne cruda, or raw, just pure raw meat. After the whippings, they were then branded with a hot cattle iron on their cheek, and the brand was D for deserter. After that, they had a collar put around their necks and were sent to hard labor um, in Mexico. Those who deserted after the declaration of war were sentenced to be hanged by the neck until dead. Um, ultimately, 48 of them were hanged. And they were not hanged where they were dropped from a scaffold in the neck snap. They were hanged so they choked to death. Uh, hanged from uh, the back of a wagon, several wagons. Um, it was the largest hanging there in the history of North America. What's really interesting to me, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this a little later when I talk about the book, was when I began doing research for this, I was told that there's no such thing, that this was Mexican propaganda. There was, there was no Irish battalion. Uh, so anyway, uh, after this hanging, uh, the Americans occupied Mexico City for almost a, a year and a half. They collected all the tariffs, all the import duties, they collected all the money from the mines. Uh, meanwhile, in California, of course, they discovered gold, uh, but they didn't let the Mexicans know that they had discovered this gold because the Mexicans might drive a hard bargain and might refuse to surrender. Um, and convinced Mexico to sign a treaty ceding the following. All of Arizona, Lower Texas, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, part of Colorado, Kansas, and Wyoming. Half of the Mexican territory, over 2 million square miles, uh, 2 million square kilometers, <coughs> or 760,000 square miles. It was the largest conquest of territory in the history of the Americas. The largest, about the third largest in the world, I believe. And what's really interesting, and this is why this is a bipartisan uh, group here, so I'll address it. When President Obama visited West Point, he said, the great thing about being an American is that we have never invaded another country for territory. <laughs> and he's a graduate of Harvard Law School. So, <laughs> so, so if, you don't, if you don't know this story, or if you've never heard of this story, don't feel bad, because it's not taught in most schools. I didn't know about this until I was 35 years old. Yeah. And even when you know about it, you still don't know all the details. For example, there was a small book written about this by a fellow by the name of Robert Ryle Miller. And Robert Ryle Miller says, well, they were mostly drunks and malcontents. Of course, they were Irish. What else do you expect? <laughs> Secondly of all, these punishments were not extraordinary. They were common in the 1840s. And thirdly, not one of them claimed at his trial racial discrimination or religious discrimination, you know. And, and surely they would, if that was true. So I wrote Mr. Miller, or Dr. Miller, and I said, you know, I'm investigating the San Francisco Battalion, just on my own. This was in 1990. He was professor of history at Oklahoma. And, and I said, you don't think religion played a part? He said, well, 
Not that I reflect on it, it certainly probably did. But he said, I, I didn't want to go there, it was too messy. <laughs> and I said, okay, I said, another question, did you look at any Mexican documents? He said, no, I went to the Archivos Nacional, but they wouldn't let me in because I didn't have the right documentation. And I said, okay. So those are the things I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the Archivos Nacional, Archivos Federal in Mexico City. Uh, I'm going to go to all the, uh, the battlefield. And I'm also going to go to the military archives in Washington, D.C. And fortunately for me, I got a job teaching at the American School of Guadalajara. And my third year there, someone said, Dr. Holmes, would you mind taking a group of Mexican kids to Washington, D.C. They're in Week Without Walls? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So we went to Washington, D.C. I went to the military archives with this group of kids. And I said to the archivist, do you have anything on the San Patricia Battalion? He said, what did you hear about them? And I said that there was an Irish, well, no, they weren't really all Irish. There, there were some Germans in there, there were some Scots in there, there were some English in there. I said, but mostly Irish? Yeah, yeah, mostly Irish. And he said, the army for a long time, you know, said that they didn't exist. But he said, yeah, they do exist. I said, so do you have files on them? No, no files. I said, really? He said, no, because the cases were not appealed. He said, so they never made it to the Supreme Court, they were never challenged. And I said, so you have nothing? I didn't say I didn't have nothing. I, I, I said, no files. I said, well, what do you have? He says, I have five boxes of just stuff, papers. And I said, could I make copies? He said, sure. The dollar copy, there's probably about 30,000 copies. 30, His name was Michael Pilgrim. And I said, look, I've got all these Mexican kids with me. We're on a tour of Washington, D.C. I can't spend time copying. And even if I could, I don't have $30,000. He said, well, leave me your details, and I'll see what I can do. Three months later, three months later, he called me at my house. He says, how does $35 sound? <laughs> he put the entire five boxes on microfiche, and I was able to access them at the University of Guadalajara. And I just want to put a little footnote in here this morning because I was reading an article on how much John F. Kennedy admired Abraham Lincoln. He said, even though I'm a Democrat, you know, Democrats and Republicans can sometimes agree on certain things. And um, <laughs> one of the things that the story about Michael Pilgrim, who I thanked and acknowledged in the book, uh, showed me that, that even though we are from different sides or different political ideas, we can still come together in important ways. And I'm so glad, you know, this morning to acknowledge, you know, the ambassador, uh, uh, Marga Young, uh, Gonzalez Marga Young here in the front seat, my friend Carlos. But here's a, here's a quote from Kennedy I just love, and I think it's appropriate for this morning's talk. John F. Kennedy in 1962, to those allies those old allies, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do, for we dare not meet the powerful challenges of the world at odds and split asunder. So anyway, with the new information I got from the military archives, um, I found a number of things. First of all, some did in fact claim that they had uh, other reasons for deserving. Um, but none of those reasons would have been a valid defense under the law. Secondly of all, I found a book, and it was called Details of Court Martial Proceedings and Rules, 1847. And it said, for the crime of diversion, uh, desertion, the punishment is as follows. One of the following three. A, a heavy collar and labor, and, and hard labor for the duration of the war. Or, whipping at the stake no more than 40 lashes. Or, branding with indelible ink. Hmm. The punishment for desertion 
after war has been declared, is firing squad. Hanging is reserved only for those who rape civilians or who are found behind enemy lines in civilian clothes as spies. So we violate our own rules in the court martial. We call them deserters and drunks and did not examine the race question. We thought the, the punishments were typical. They were, in fact, not. So anyway, this, this book came out in 1997. And one of the interesting things about the book is that it was accepted almost immediately by Oxford University Press. They assigned me an editor, we did major revisions, and then when it came time to be published, they wrote me and said, we just had a meeting of our marketing people, and they approached California, and they approached Texas, uh, uh, to see if the schools would carry the book, and they said no, they wouldn't carry it because they considered anti-American. And since this is the largest market for history books, we have to turn you down. Uh, it was ultimately published by the Colegio Militar and the University of Guadalajara in combination by a lad by the name of Manuel Caballo. I don't know if Manuel is here today. Uh, but it went through four editions in English, two editions in Spanish, and then in 2001, 9-11, uh, they stopped importing books from Mexico to the United States unless we went through a uh, middleman who wanted 50%, and the university said, no, we're not going to pay that. So it was out of print for basically 10 years, and I put it back up on Amazon when Amazon came out with the Kindle and the Create Space in 2010, and it immediately went to number one spot in Ireland and number one in Mexico every, every March. And now we've got, Emmanuel Caballo just did a hundred copies for this presentation, so it's, it's back so we can see it. Um, can a book change history? You know? I know every writer thinks, boy, wouldn't that be great if that could happen? This book, in fact, did, and it has really nothing to do with me. It just has to do with something coming at the right time in the right place. But a year after the publication of Irish Soldiers in 1997, there was a documentary made by Jason Poole called The Soldiers of St. Patrick. It was immediately bought by the, by the uh, History Channel, uh, cheap, for $10,000. But we wanted to get the word out there in time for the anniversary, uh, the 150th anniversary. And we were all gathered around the television to watch this great uh, documentary. And instead, there was a documentary on the Mexican War by David Eisenhower. They had used the $10,000 fee to kill the, uh, the killer. Uh, they bought the American, the North American serial rights and killed it. Um, the next thing was the Mexican Post Office Department, the Irish Post Office, issued a joint communicative stamp, commemorative stamp. The following year there was an MGM movie, So So, right out, not that great, but called One Man's Hero, which at least got the story out there. There was a musical CD produced in Ireland with Ray Cooter and the, Ray Cooter and the Chieftains. A Mexican general, Cleva Chavez Marin, uh, had the book translated into Spanish. Uh, the Jalisco legislature put in gold letters, Héroes de la República, uh, La Batalla de San Patricio. Uh, the Federal Republic uh, Congress also put gold letters up in their, in their uh, um, meeting place, just beneath Hidalgo and Benito Juarez. Uh, a novel, Molly Malone and the San Patricios came out. San Patricio Tequila came out. <laughs> a new documentary, The Search for John Riley, came out. And also, Alex published an article on uh, the uh, search for John Riley and what really happened to him at the end. A memorial was elected in Clifton Galway on behalf of the Mexican government, uh, commemorating his actions. And a bust was erected in Mexico City as a gift of the Irish government. <clears throat> the last known words of Riley, in response to a former employer in Canada, who wrote and asked why he was living in Mexico, uh, which seemed to him to be a barbarous and dangerous place, Riley responded, Be not deceived by a country which has been at war with Mexico. Mexicans are among the most hospitable people on earth. I know of no other which are as welcoming.
So those are some of the cultural things, but the solidarity between Mexico and Ireland has resulted in new trade relationships, massive use of Cemex, uh, Mexican cement, for Dublin construction, scholarships for Mexican students to Trinity and NUI Galway, cultural exchanges between the two countries, Irish dance schools in Guadal 